Ryan, Libra is the Spanish word for free. Is that really your family name? I was not born with uh, the last name Libre, and in fact, my real last name is a secret. It's quite important for the work I do, but I changed my last name when I went in 1999 to Cuba, Cuba Libre, and I rode my bike around the country for five weeks, and when I came home, then I just kind of had an epiphany and changed my name to Libre, which not only means free, but it also means available, not having to do with money, and uh, it can mean unmarried as well. <laughs> so many meanings of the word libre. Uh, Good, I might change my name to that too. Start a movement. Start a movement. Good. Could you tell us, uh, Ryan, how you first heard about the Kachin, which you're so synonymous with? It started out in Chiang Mai at the Pan Pan Organic Farm. One day they told me there would be many Burmese students coming to study. And I went up and introduced myself to one of them and said, hello, you must be one of the Burmese students. And she looked me in the eye and said, I'm not Burmese, I'm Kachin. So I became quite interested and asked her to tell me more about the Kachin. And she shared with me a very interesting story of, a, of an ethnic and religious minority that are living in the Himalaya and have a totally distinct language and culture and tradition from the Burmese, but have been occupied by the Burmese government for more than 50 years. So how did you end up going there for the first time? How did that come about? Well, I had a lot of curiosity myself, and I figured if I did, and I looked online, and I didn't find really much of anything online or in magazines, and when it, any place did talk about the Kachin, it was just kind of like a sideline. It wasn't really stories about the Kachin. So I thought I should go myself and, and see for myself and then try to share that with other people. And I applied for a grant from the Pulitzer Center. And fortunately, they funded me for one month to go. In retrospect, I'm not really sure why, as I had zero journalism experience, just photography. But they did. And uh, a few days later, I crossed into, into the Kachin state that's controlled by the Kachin Independence Organization, which is has completely independent from the Burmese government. All right. Speaking of the Burmese government, what fact about the Kachin do you think that the Burmese government would like to hide the most? Uh, when I went there, I was very surprised that I was expecting to see just a rebel army, but in fact, they have a full civilian government. You know, they have immigration, they have mm. schools, they have health care, they have national library, uh, just a, f a full government there. And I think really that's, I think, a bigger threat to the, the Burmese occupation than the army is. Um, that if they were given uh, autonomy or an independent state, then they actually have the experience and the ability to run it. Okay, terrific. And what are the most serious issues facing the uh, Kachin today then? There's a lot of serious issues they're facing, <clears throat> especially about there's a, the political situation, the environmental situation, cultural and health as well. Politically, they tried to join the last elections in Burma, but their party was banned. Then the Kachin leaders tried to run as independents or join other parties, and they were banned from that. Then they canceled voting in much of the Kachin state. Then they said no campaigning related to like state rights or federal system is allowed. And then when the students tried to boycott the election, they arrested the students. They completely shut out politically. Uh, environmentally, the Kachin is a very rich resource state. They have plenty of things to provide for themselves for many generations to come, including jade, gold, timber, and a lot of hydropower potential. But as it is now, uh, a lot of the Burmese and uh, the Chinese are coming and taking all of the resources by bribing the Burmese government. And many Kachins are worried even their own children will grow up in a Kachin state that is stripped of its natural resources and its natural beauty. Okay, switching tax to the subject of your talk today, why do you think that we actually need 100 million New photojournalists. That's a fair few. <laughs> well, um, when I went to the Kachin State on my very first day, I met the head of the National Library, and he showed me an article in the San Francisco Chronicle, and it said that the Kachins were animists. And having spent only a few hours there at that point, it was overwhelmingly obvious to me that the Kachin were devout Christian. So I thought, how did a newspaper I grew up reading and respected make such a fundamental error? And some people say, okay, it's a small error, but really, if this writer doesn't know the religion of the Kachin, 
you know, how can I trust that they know their, their hopes and fears, their worldview and way of life, and their current situation and where they're going? Mm -hmm. And can anybody become a photojournalist? Well, I don't recommend uh, everyone run out and go live with the rebel army tomorrow. Um, but I think that a lot of people here, they have some background knowledge, they have some access, some contacts, and more time to spend to cover one story than many members of the professional press. And I think if they do that, and also I'm, I'm not saying that every blog can replace a professional journalist. I think if people want to do this, that they're going to need to put in a lot of effort and, and refine their skills to make meaningful contributions. But I, I think they can very much do very meaningful things. And I think it's very important to have more people on the ground covering things, spending time with things, You've won awards and grants for your work. Does that automatically make you a professional? Well, I consider myself an amateur, actually. Um, and the word amateur, in its origins, it comes from the origins of love. And 100 years ago, in the world of photography, if you called someone an amateur, that was the highest compliment. And a professional was just kind of thought of someone that opened a studio and clicked portraits, next, next, next. So somehow in the modern uh, material world, these things have been really switched upside down. And people think that professional is synonymous with quality and amateur is someone without experience or skills. Um, so I think that that line is very gray, but I like to consider myself an amateur because my motivation does not come from money. And I... Well, clearly you have a very strong motivation because as I understand it, you were a soldier before. And I know the audience today can't see what's under your sleeve, but there's actually a big tattoo of the Sanskrit word for peace under his sleeve there, which you had, I believe, before you even left the army. Yes. <laughs> um, so how has being a soldier helped your understanding uh, of their, their fight and their plight? Well, it's been very interesting because uh, I, I left from the army. I went AWOL, um, largely because I felt like I wasn't really fighting for uh, real freedoms. For the fr I was fighting to control other people's governments and resources, not my own. And I, when I met the Kachin, you know, in many ways I was actually jealous of the soldiers. That they, I felt they had a more noble cause than I did as a soldier. That they were fighting for, to control their own government and resources. And it helped very much for me to relate with them, understand them, know what they're thinking at different times. And certainly the project would have been very different if I had not had that experience. Okay, and you founded the documentary Arts Asia in 2008. Can you tell me some of the aims of that particular project? Uh, specifically, uh, we're trying to start an artist in residence program in Chiang Mai. Uh, and right now the launch date is in November. We're going to bring a filmmaker or photographer to Chiang Mai to uh, document some issue. They'll send in proposals. And we'll just basically give them an apartment and some food and, and maybe a bicycle and just let them work. Because right now, you know, there's a lot of artists that are very qualified that just need some space and a bit of time to do some really amazing work. So we're going to be doing that and also starting a library and gallery for people who are already involved in documentary arts to come and learn more and grow, but also to bring in a lot more people and start them uh, on this route to maybe being one of these 100 million new journalists. Right, fantastic. And you're uh, already working, I understand, on a documentary, work in progress at the moment? Uh, yeah, I've been switching over, like a lot of people, from stills to film. Not switching, but doing it in addition. And it's very, very new to me, but a very powerful medium to see people speak in their own words, rather than me writing captions and telling people what to think. Right. And was this a self-funded project, Ryan? Yes. I, I had the first trip was covered by the Pulitzer Center, and after that it's been all self-funded, um, which is, is never easy, but I, I love it, and uh, it's a very important story, so I'm quite committed to it. Okay, terrific. And it's called Portraits of Independence. Okay, and we've got some footage. Perhaps we can uh, roll that now. Can we uh, have the video, please, Maestro?
One day, our kitchen will disappear from the wall. We have dropped down our weapons. It is really crucial time for the kitchen. Sorry, it's not a good signal for the future. The Chinchiran need to speak only Bamis. So our Gitsin language and Gitsin culture are disappearing. <laughs> That is the reality of the Chin people today. We're struggling now. And one last question. What is your greatest hope for the Kachin people? Well, one of my nicknames is the chronic optimist. And while not everyone thinks it's possible, uh, I can imagine one day that they have an independent country. And some people say, well, why? There are only a million people. But uh, in the very recent history, there's East Timor that was a very uh, many similarities with East Timor, uh, ethnic and religious minority controlled by uh, occupied by a big military dictatorship and they got independence, and they're an independent country now. And it's going to take a lot of work from a lot of people if anything like that ever happens, but that would be my greatest dream. Thank you.